Hi guys, Clem here from the online flooring store again with Talk and Flooring. Um, a common question I, I often find myself on the phone talking to a lot of people about is soundproofing your floors. Um, I'll, I'll lead up front by, say, by saying I'm not an acoustic engineer, but I did spend a couple of years in a company where I left the flooring industry for two years, worked in their structural noise engineering division, and the company also had a flooring division. So after two years, there was a uh, a need to fill a role in the flooring division, so I went back over there. Um, but it did give me a pretty good understanding of, of structural noise, particularly, but also as a result, airborne noise um, and how that affects things as well. So soundproofing your floors, um, it, it's quite a it's it's quite a large um, thing to talk about because you've you've basically got two different kinds of noise that you deal with. You've got what's called airborne noise and what's called structural noise. So how do they work? If I'm standing here talking to you, or let's say there's a door, right? And you and I are both standing on this side of the door and I walk up and I knock on the door. We hear the airborne noise. So that's the noise that's generated that travels as sound waves through the air. If I'm on this side of the door and you're on the other side of the door and I knock, I hear airborne noise you hear structural noise. And that's noise that's coming into, or vibrational energy traveling into something, and then the vibration of that causing the air on the other side to, to vibrate that, um, that sound outward. So that's called structural noise. Most of how we attenuate things, or the need to attenuate things in flooring is through structural noise. Airborne noise is a little bit more difficult to control with, with the flooring, it's, it's really, um, you can put different underlays under your floor to help take out some of the energy, but most of it's coming off the surface of the floor. You can deal with that with um, things like, you know, cushions, couches, soft things in your home, um, curtains, big thick curtains, rugs on the floor. All of that stuff helps to attenuate and absorb that airborne noise that's floating around. Structural noise is a little bit different. so. It will, you'll hear that coming down through typically the floor above you. And that's the, the energy entering into the flooring and then re-radiating through the structure of the home. Quite often, um, you know, people who are, who are in apartments are given ratings that they have to meet. Now there's, there's two that are in, in common use. One is an older rating and it's called FIIC or Field Impact Isolation Class or sometimes just IOC, which is Impact Isolation Class. Um, and that's an older rating. Um, what we tend to use today is called LNTW or LN, W, depending on when the, when the rating was done. They do mean slightly different things. LNTW means loudness, normalized, time, weighted, and weighted as in weight, not as in weighting. Um, so the LNTW rating tends to tend to come out to a decibel rating. So if I say, oh, you've got to achieve 53 decibels, your LNTW is typically, is typically that rating. Um, so you're, atten you're wanting to attenuate the noise going through into the, the say you might have a, a need um, if you've got an apartment building or you're in an apartment building and you've got a residence underneath, or it could be your own home and you just try to reduce the sound that's going through the floors. So we'll, we'll just talk briefly about if you're given a rating you have to meet. Quite often, um, quite often you've got situations where a body corporate has given you a rating and they'll just say you've got to reach 60. Well, first thing you've got to know is, is it 60 LNTW or is it 60 FIIC? Because if it's LNTW, home and hose, just about anything you put on your floor will get you there. If it's 60 FIIC, that's really, really tough to meet because those ratings work in, in different ways. One goes up, one goes down. So LNTW, the lower your rating, the better. FIRC, the higher the rating, the better. Um, they don't always pan out. Like there's no no real true method for of exchange between them because one's measuring sound leakage, one's measuring sound pressure, and those two things aren't always interchangeable. What I have noticed over the years so <coughs> is that at around 52 and a half, it's not always exact, but at around 52 and a half is their crossover point. So if you're looking at one at 60, you subtract seven and a half, brings you down to 50, 52 and a half, subtract another 
uh, seven and a half of that brings you down to about 45. Now that's not an exact science, um, it's far from an exact science, but it's just an observation I've made over the years of, of having to deal with these things. Um, so attenuating that is done through, uh, you know, when we're talking structural noise, a process called static deflection. So you take a medium and you compress it. So the more you compress that medium, the more um, energy is taken out of um, the, the energy coming downwards into the floor underneath. Now, the, the challenge you've got with flooring underlays is you can't have too much movement or if you've got a floated floor with a locking system and that locking system's moving up and down, that joint is being subjected to stress. So there cannot be, like if you take, you think people think, oh, I'll put a carpet underlay underneath it, it'll be really good. The problem is that a 15 millimeter carpet underlay that's designed for carpet will destroy your floor, your floated floor because there's just too much bounce in it. So most of your flooring underlays are like a two or a three millimeter foam, or you can go into three, and three to five millimeter rubbers. In most cases, the rubber is of no use to you. The only time a rubber is really of use is if you're doing a, a timber floor and you're doing a process called dual bonding, where you take the rubber, you glue the rubber to the floor, and then you glue the product to the rubber. The reason you use that is because the adhesives won't work with the foam underlays. So if it's a floated floor, which um, most people would use, um, you, you just require your standard underlays. So there's a, there's a couple of different kinds of foam. The, this one here is a, is a product called a, an open cell foam. I'll bring it closer so you can see. But the open cell foam is kind of translucent. You can see through it. Um, and it looks like there's a bunch of air bubbles in it. It's, it's very lightweight. Um, and it's really not gonna do much after about six to 12 months. That will eventually flatten out. And all it really does is acclimatize you to the sound of your floor going from okay down to noisy. Um, really what you wanna be using is a closed cell foam, right? So a closed cell foam, it looks like a gym mat you'd see like at a martial arts studio, those Ziploc mats, okay? So it's, it's solid color, it's smooth, um, and it's much higher density than what this is. So those things will last the life of your floor. Now you can start getting into densities and stuff, but in most cases in the residential environment, doesn't really matter too much. Um, most of your floors are not extremely heavy weight, so the need for a higher density really isn't there. And a, a floated floor acts like a compression plate where when I stand onto it, if I stand onto that, my weight isn't just transferred into that point because the, the floor has rigidity, my rate is spread out. So there's a lot of underlay there that's gotta be compressed. So what we found at the company I used to work at was, you know, the higher density acoustic underlays, we would try them and in a lot of cases they wouldn't perform as well as the lighter weight products because of that compression plate principle, they weren't compressing enough to offer the same acoustic benefit. Um, so, you know, we at the time had a, a 33 kilogram a cubic meter density underlay, which was providing better result than our 100 kilogram a cubic meter density underlay. It does change a bit with airborne noise. Um, and those underlays tend to work a little bit better for airborne noise, but for structural noise, noise, um, it, it, it's not that important. Um, you're gonna find that, um, that even the lighter weight closed cell foams will do the job nicely for you. Um, but most, most suppliers will, will publish a test result telling you what their underlays achieve. They're not always completely correct because you've got to look at the details. Um, some, they won't mention that there's a, a suspended ceiling in the, in, the, um, in the test. Others will use publisher results uh, that they've, they've had in a, in a building, which is a site test. You're supposed to publish lab tests. That way the, um, the baseline is always exactly the same when you introduce factors for different buildings into the equation, the baseline changes. So it's, it's, not, always, um, it's not always as accurate, but it, it is still a pretty good indication. Um, but look, the, um, the, the best way to, to reduce, you know, the, um, the structure worn noise, if you've got a pretty, if you've got a really difficult rating you have to meet, it's getting, it's getting um, the isolator and getting weight on top of it. So, we had a particularly difficult job to do do one one time um, where you know they wanted a concrete screed and they wanted a 10 millimeter rubber underlay and then the product on top 
And an engineer I worked with said, well, look, why don't we, rather than doing it this way, put the underlay on the bottom, then put your concrete screed on top and then your flooring, and it got the weight onto the, um, onto the isolator, which, which gave us a much better acoustic result just by flipping the system a little bit. Now, that's if you have a really, really tough rating to achieve. Um, most, most aren't that difficult, but, but some, um, you know, if you're replacing carpet and they've, they've got it rated for carpet, it can become very difficult. Um, so it's always best to um, do your homework on that sort of stuff, but, um, you know, your, your mass of your floor on the underlay is what's going to what's gonna, um, help you there. Also, ensuring that um, the, the floor doesn't physically touch the walls of, of the house, um, and even if you're putting your, your skirting around the outside, leave a business card between the skirting and the floor. That way it's not physically touching it because any of that energy travels into the structure and, and travels downward. Um, like electricity, we'll all just find a way. Um, so it's best to do it that way. Airborne noise is a lot easier to deal with. As I said, it's, it's basically, um, you know, you want soft furnishings, pillows, couches, rugs. You know, when I used to play in bands years ago when I was young, we used to have a, a studio that was, we had egg crates all over the wall and we had blankets hanging from the ceiling. All of that sort of stuff takes the, the, the sting out of the noise. Um, so struck, we've, we've talked about the ratings. Um, we've talked about how to deal with it. So I guess the, the thing is don't, don't make too many assumptions. Always do your homework. Um, you know, if, you, if you're going to put something into a, into a high-rise unit, it can be quite difficult if you go ahead and do it and it fails a test. So, you know, sometimes it's best to, to have an acoustic consultant come and do a test. It's going to cost you some money to start with. Um, but if you want that absolute, you know, you want that kind of flooring, it, it's going to be more economical to have that done and confirm that it's okay than to go ahead and do it and then have to pull it back up because you've, you've failed a rating um, and essentially do that floor twice. Um, but look, if you've got any, any questions, I'm happy to chat to you about it. Just do bear in mind, I'm not an acoustic engineer. I, I've, um, I have worked in the industry and I have on-site experience and I have a fair bit of that. But anything that's really, really difficult, you're always going to want to go and engage an acoustic consultant um, because this stuff can be... Um, you know, it can be quite problematic for you if you get it wrong. If it's your own home, though, it's there's no there's no need um, for any of that. You can just do it to your leisure. Um, you don't really require any sort of attenuation in your own home. But if you are doing it in your own home, um, you know, you just want to make sure you've got a decent underlay under the floor, so some sort of closed cell foam. If it's a if you're using a um, like a laminate or a timber floor. If you're using a hybrid floor, the Terramata Resi Plank does really well because it's got it's got a slightly thicker underlay, but it's also got a lot of weight in the core of the product. And what that does, you get the weight onto that underlay, it grips the floor really hard, and it just makes it quite like, really really good for um, for the transmission of structural noise. So, you know, the Resi Plank um, 9.7 mil product um, just straight out of the box is is really acoustically a, a very very good product. Look. Happy for you guys to call any time um, and just find us on onlinefloorstore.com.au.